Good afternoon to you. Mark Sutter, HurricaneTrack.com, here with your Hurricane Outlook and discussion. Just a few more days that I call it the off-season edition, and then we begin the Eastern Pacific hurricane season. So let's start off today. A lot to talk about. We're going to begin with the Southern Oscillation Index, or the SOI. This is the basic way to put it, a measure of the pressure tendencies in the tropical Pacific, the differences between Tahiti and Darwin, which is in Australia, of course, Darwin is. And basically when we have a negative SOI number, especially in the long term, 30, 90 days and beyond, that's more of an El Nino type pattern of pressure across the Pacific. And when the uh, SOI is positive, then the reverse tends to happen. And you have a net movement of air that is more from east to west. The trades resume, and maybe sometimes they're stronger than average, and that leads to a La Nina pattern with a positive SOI. So where are we? Well, this is the latest information. In the 30-day, we're still negative, and the 90-day is, is negative as well. We're certainly uh, a little bit higher than the April average, which was minus 19. But look at today's number, the what we call the daily contributor. There it is at positive 18 and this will keep chipping away at the overall negative values which makes sense because we are heading into a La Nina pattern and you can see that in the Pacific sea surface temperature anomaly profile here with this blue ribbon if you want to call it that stretching out now across the equatorial uh, Pacific and that will continue to grow it does look like as the warmth from the pretty substantial El Nino continues to dissipate Meanwhile, in the tropical Atlantic here, the MDR, main development region, continues to warm. There is no way around it. I mean, there's no, you know, like, well, uh, you might be stretching a little bit there, Mark. That in that box is warm. Look at all that. It's, you know, right here in the scale. Uh, yes, the North Atlantic up here is still colder, and that too is getting chipped away a little bit, and I'll show you that in a moment. But uh, this is very interesting because... Some of the forecasts that have come out as of late in the last six weeks or so assumed that this region would not be this warm. So it's going to be interesting at the end of the month when we get some more updates coming out. Will those forecasts be revised upward? I think they will. The rest of the Atlantic Basin generally warmer than it should be in most areas. A few pockets of cold anomalies here and there. But this region here, the MDR, uh, put a check mark in it as being a positive sign for hurricane development. Not necessarily, obviously, a positive sign if you live along the coast, but you know, just because there's hurricanes doesn't mean they're going to hit. First, you have to have the hurricanes, then you worry about where they go, and that's what we do here. So let's take a zoomed in look at the main development region here, just right off the immediate coast of Africa, maybe a little bit of upwelling or churning of the water or something, but everywhere west of there, certainly west of the Cape Verde Islands, which are here, uh, to the Lesser Antilles over here to the west, substantially above where it should be for this time of year. And in some instances, that's correct, <clears throat> looking at almost a degree Celsius above the long-term average through here. And compare that to what it looked like this time last year. Here we are today, and here's what it looked like a year ago. I mean, really, a stark contrast uh, to what we had this time last year. The El Nino was coming on in the Pacific. The deep tropical Atlantic was about as cold as you could ask for, and you saw what happened. We had basically a non-season for the United States, not so for Dominica and not so for parts of the Bahamas. This was Erica that went through Dominica and dumped a lot of rainfall as a tropical storm. And then, of course, Hurricane Joaquin here in parts of the central Bahamas a devastating Category 4 in early October. So this will be something to watch here, this anomaly pattern. Another way to look at it, this is neat, the um, difference over the last several weeks is a good way to look at things, how have th things progressed over time, and you can shorten that window. And as you can see, and, and this is clear to see, the change in weekly sea surface temperature anomalies, obviously the left side of the scale would be a decrease, and the right-hand side of the scale would be an increase. And we see two things here that are important in my eyes. Three, actually. Let's add one more. 
the warmth in the main development region clearly on the right hand side of the scale and look at this a warming of the far northern Atlantic remember the cold pool up here we've been hearing a lot about that well it's starting to warm up there south of Greenland and the northern part of the Atlantic and in some cases if you look closely look at that um, I guess you could call these isotherms right lines of equal temperature so look in here that deep red it's warmed up a couple of degrees Celsius since uh, the 6th of April and then conversely look at what's happening here in the Pacific overall the Pacific is cooling overall the Atlantic looks to be warming that is a big signal we'll see how it progresses and then adding a little bit more to it all this continues to impress me very much the giant area of cold anomalies in the subsurface of the tropical Pacific this is updated just a few days ago only a small area of warmth is left this is the growing and burgeoning La Nina several gradations of cold or blue uh, showing up now and it's just a matter of time most of the models indicating uh, weak to moderate now moderate La Nina setting in by August September October and all of this I think starts to sort of tip the needle more towards a more favorable Atlantic hurricane season not perhaps hyperactive like 05 or 2010 and even 2012 we got all the way down to Sandy at least maybe beyond I can't remember but Sandy I mean the S storm in 2012 four short years ago uh, it's not not that long ago um, that's pretty significant so you know we don't may not be that busy but instead of 10 or 11 name storms I, you know I'm not gonna forecast I don't put out any numbers myself I'm just not that's not my thing but looking at what other people put out Colorado State University NC State Weather Channel the weather company AccuWeather uh, Joe Bastardi and his team at Weatherbell a lot of people put these forecasts out I want to see if I understand the reasoning behind it one way or another and these puzzle pieces do help me to make sense of it all and I see that the early forecasts from some of these agencies and private entities in March and April may need to be revised upward as we get towards the end of this month and into June and of course at the end of the month we'll have the uh, <coughs> excuse me the first official forecast from NOAA they do a, a hurricane seasonal forecast as well alright so actual sea surface temperatures certainly making progress in the Gulf of Mexico all of this green coloring in here 26 degrees Celsius or higher and certainly down in the Bay of Campeche warmer than that we're talking about upper 80s for actual sea surface temperatures in Fahrenheit and uh, the 27 degree isotherm Celsius I know I keep switching back and forth uh, that's about 81 Fahrenheit uh, certainly in the southeast Gulf as you know I say it, it and it makes sense the Gulf's always going to be warm enough uh, it seems except 2010 was a little different that was a weird year uh, but you know it's by August the Gulf will be plenty warm uh, I like to just kind of see how things are progressing you know overall in which areas the loop current sets up if there is one and you notice that the shelf water up here in the Northeast Gulf still lagging just a little bit and it'll catch up and all the uh, beachgoers by the time we get to June 1st you know just a few weeks away will be enjoying close to 80 degree water looking at the western Atlantic now this is interesting uh, check it out the 26 degree isotherm has really made its way into the picture here this is the 80 degree line or 79 and a half Fahrenheit to be precise and um, that's pretty substantial here's 25 Celsius right up here uh, we're talking about just a little bit north of 38 degrees latitude and so we're making some serious inroads uh, along the Gulf Stream anyway of the 80 degree line and um, areas off of the Carolina coast here water temperatures in the low 70s and warming rapidly as we have all this heat and humidity building and the profile of the ocean and atmosphere interaction is favorable for that to continue and uh, yeah it won't be long that we can all go in the water here anywhere south of Hatteras especially up here along the mid-Atlantic in New England yeah forget about it it's not not for me I have to have a wetsuit eight degrees Celsius up here off of Cape Cod I'm gonna pass on that considering that 10 Celsius is 50 degrees Fahrenheit 
No, thank you. Water temperature in the upper 40s. I cannot imagine. All right, so we're coming up on the start of the eastern Pacific hurricane season, as I alluded to uh, at the beginning of the video blog here. The east Pacific season begins on May the 15th, and the Atlantic season June the 1st. It's interesting because you have eight development areas over the past 100-plus years in the Atlantic Basin during the 10-day time period coming up and you have eight development areas in the Eastern Pacific. So why not start both basins on the same date, May 15th? I don't know. Um, maybe one day if I'm bored enough, I'll go look that up and ask some questions. Who came up with these arbitrary dates? And why is June 1st the Atlantic when there are clearly eight development areas you know, in the middle of May, for goodness sakes? But all of that's trivial. We need to focus on what's going to be happening in the Eastern Pacific is typically pretty busy overall. Not many seasons where it's just completely dead out there. And there's a lot of real estate here along the Pacific coast from Central America up to the northwest from there along Mexico. And that season is about to start. Water temperatures warming up, the atmosphere beginning to become favorable. So we'll have to start watching that. And these video updates will be more frequent, not quite daily unless there's something to... Um, talk about for the Eastern Pacific and then in June of course they will become daily unless things are just dead calm out there but just a reminder May 15th is the beginning of the East Pac hurricane season and that being said in just a few days I'll do another update to start that uh, I don't see anything so far in the modeling to suggest anything to worry about just yet so let's move to lower 48 weather but an active period for severe weather you may have seen the tornado in eastern Colorado on YouTube and social media. Um, pretty impressive. I think the city was called Ray, W-R-A-Y. I guess that's how you say that. Uh, from Reed Timmer. Or, I don't know if he took it, but somebody on his team did. Not quite sure all about how all that works, but a very photogenic tornado. Unfortunately, there were some injuries. I didn't see any deaths reported, so that's always good. Uh, looking at this map, it doesn't look like it's very active out there, but if we look at the Storm Prediction Center, that certainly tells a different story. Still have an active period of severe weather in the heart of the country's, uh, well, the heart of the country, in the midsection. And uh, deep tropical moisture streaming up out of the Gulf of Mexico, pretty strong winds along parts of southeast Texas. If you're watching from there, you know that already. And so we do have an enhanced to slight uh, I guess really look at it the other way, slight to enhanced risk of severe weather uh, in the southeast part of Tornado Alley, and then a little bit of thunderstorm general activity here in parts of the North Carolina Tidewater area, inland towards the I-95 corridor, same thing true for Virginia, but nothing widespread, basically just isolated. Looking tomorrow for severe weather, um, kind of a large chunk of the country with the possibility of some convective activity and fancy way of saying a few thunderstorms here and there anywhere in this light green coloring and then in the darker green green it gets a little bit more concentrated and then the yellow even more concentrated than that I think you can deduce that yourself but the bottom line here we're not seeing any widespread major worrisome severe weather outbreaks obviously something could happen in your local area that would be worrisome and severe so you just have to stay on top of it moving ahead to day three again a large area of the country as the air mass gets juicier and juicier here east of the rockies the chance of air mass thunderstorms or just pop-up convection here and there begins to increase from here until the end of summer you would think and so that's why we see the general green for instability and thunderstorm potential but then again like i said the darker green and the yellow, a little bit more of a risk than that. And then going on out into the future, it's amazing to have these outlooks all the way out. Day four, and then day five, six, seven, and eight. Luckily, nothing shows up on their radar, so to speak, uh, pun intended, as being probabilistically enhanced enough to even show up. So that's good news. Uh, nothing. I tell you, when something shows up that far out, you got to really worry about it. So at least there's not that. All right. So there you go. Things are looking interesting in the tropics as we get ready to begin the hurricane season. Just a few weeks away now. Again, the Eastern Pacific season officially begins on May the 15th. And as I said, I'll be covering that. 
uh, from time to time, especially when things brew and there is something to talk about. If you're watching this on YouTube proper, right on YouTube itself, don't forget to subscribe for more video updates. And we do have an app, a uh, mobile app for iPhone and Android. It's called Hurricane Impact. Two different words there, Hurricane Impact, because that's what we generally focus on is the impact of tropical storms and hurricanes. And you can watch these video blogs on the go in the app. Search for it on the App Store or on Google Play, Hurricane Impact. And uh, there you go. There's my plug for a couple of our products for you. And um, that's it. I'll wrap it up again, as always. Thanks for watching. I do appreciate your time and attention. Hopefully you learned something from these discussions. They will become more and more important as we get into the hurricane season. And I look forward to utilizing some of our tools to show you and explain what's happening and how to best prepare for it. Have a great rest of your Monday. I am Mark Suttoth for HurricaneTrack.com. And I'll talk to you again on the 15th when the East Pack season begins.